Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Good to see you again, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, myself, John Coleman, my business partner, co-founder of Celebrating Act 2, Art Kirsch, and our special guest, our always favorite guest, the virtual gourmet, John Mariani. John, good to see you. Good morning. Good morning. So, um, generally speaking, we're talking about things wine and things food and fine versions of them. Uh, but there's a strange combination of uh, uh, entertainment industry, movie stuff that John and I have been involved in a long time, and it seems to be a crossover into your world, uh, Francis Ford Coppola. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, is what's the connection, and is it something that a gourmet might find interesting to, uh, to learn more about? Oh, yes, indeed. Um, Francis Ford Coppola, who's up in the Napa Valley. Um, he makes a wide range of, of wines, which I'll, I'll describe, um, but he makes some very, very good ones. His flagship uh, wines are excellent. They go for mm, 50, 60, 70 bucks a, a bottle, and they're, they're, they're really worth every penny if you like that Northern California style. And uh, he now makes much, much more money from his winery um, wine, and his wine production than he ever made from his movies, which at one point was considerable and helped him to buy his original wine estate. That's fascinating. Making more money from wine than movies. Oh. Probably only Coppola can do that. I... Well, he lost a lot of money on his movies too. You know, he was a he was one of those whiz kids of the early nineteen seventies, along with Steven Spielberg, and um, uh, and um, Martin Scorsese and uh, Brian De Palma and George Lucas. These were the whiz kids of, of their day producing, uh, to everybody's surprise, enormous blockbusters, uh, Star Wars and Indiana Jones and so forth. These were, and these, these guys were, un, some of them were under 30 years old. Um, Francis had come out of a film school and uh, had done work for Roger Corman. He wrote the script for um, Patton, the, uh, about General Patton. Uh, which I think won an Academy Award, at least, if not the best movie, was for, for uh, George C. Scott. So he was in a role, so they, they um, and he directed a couple of very small budget movies. Um, and then at Paramount, which had Bob Evans, who was the uh, young hotshot producer at Paramount at that time, uh, and was hanging out with this crowd of these young uh, filmmakers, said, okay, well, um, I think it would be good if uh, to make a movie from Mario Puzo's uh, The Godfather. And uh, Coppola originally balked, as I recall, but he says, I don't know, who wants to see a mafia movie at this is the 1970s, you know? Well, we know what happened, and he made Godfather 1, which is an astounding, not only an astounding blockbuster, but one of the finest movies ever made with uh, young Al Pacino and uh, middle-aged uh, um, uh, uh, Marlon Brando, <clears throat> just great character actors. And then it was such a big deal that, of course, he just two or three years later did uh, Godfather 2, which was equally as great a movie and equally as um, uh, great in terms of box office. Um, and then he had free reign to make what he wanted. And Apocalypse Now was not initially a success, but it recouped its, uh, its uh, losses. Um, but it took him like two, three years to make in... in uh, the Philippines, it was about the Vietnam War, obviously, um, in the Philippines, and uh, with hurricanes and dysentery and stuff, it was a disaster on the set. And he got very, very sick. Um, and then the, his, his next few movies were not very good or well-received, and he was not making money, and he was pouring his own money into it. And uh, like Peggy Sue Gets Married and um, a couple of movies like that. Godfather Three, he never wanted to make and it was just a terrible movie. Although I hear he's just he's re-releasing this December, kind of his director's cut with a new ending, so forth. Well, so by the end of the seventies and eighties, uh, he was not the young uh, star director that he had been a decade earlier. Whereas Spielberg and and Lucas retired from filmmaking and went into technology and so forth, pretty much. Um, so he and his wife, uh, Coppola's wife. Um, 
saw that the old Niebaum uh, estate, which is a very historic wine estate in Napa Valley, was for sale. And he was able to cobble together some money to buy it and started to make wines and became very, very interested in making wines because it really went back to his old childhood. So, And I interviewed him uh, a couple of months ago, and he's now about close to 80 years old, maybe even a little bit older, and still spry. You can see that he's been, I don't want to use the word chastened, but uh, he is in a very good place in his life this, this time. Think of Don Corleone if things had worked out. <laughs> Caccino is a character. Don Corleone moves back to Italy and has this grand villa and his vineyards, and he's just sitting there drinking wine, and his grandchildren come up to him, and the whole world is great. Well, it didn't end that way with for uh, Don Corleone, but it uh, and it's not about to end for um, Coppola, but he says... When I was a kid, I don't ever remember in my Italian family a uh, dinner table without uh, without wine on it. And of course, we as kids, we didn't have any interest in it, but we'd eventually get it with a seven up with a little bit of wine in it. And as things went on and on, and we grew up, we drank more wine. So we, he says, I always had wine on the set because it, it, in Italy, when they call lunch in Italy, they always have wine. You know, everybody drinks you know, a glass or two of wine and goes back to work. It's not a big deal. <laughs> in Hollywood, of course, after lunch, nobody comes back to work because they're all stoned on, 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 on coke. <laughs> and uh, so, um, so he drank it as a child, and he got serious later in life and became to appreciate it. And he started to name his wines after his own uh, children and his mother. There's Sofia Coppola. There's a, some beautiful rosé wine named after Sofia. And um, uh, it's uh, Archimedes is named after the great Archimedes, um, who was the guy who could leverage the world, the world on a lever and so forth, the great into uh, uh, wine science. But also his Coppola's grandfather had been named Archimedes, so that was a um, homage to him. So as time went on. He was doing very, very well, and uh, he made a couple of movies over in the last 20 years that did very poorly. They were filmed in Czechoslovakia or Romania to, to make uh, to, to, for, for less expensive to make it over there, but they didn't do well critically. So he's kind of retired <coughs> from movie making. He says, I still got some ideas, still got some ideas, but... If I make them, I'm going to finance them myself and not go to a studio. They're not going to cut my movies the way they cut Apocalypse Now and others. And um, he's quite content because he's become something like the seventh or ninth biggest wine companies in America. Uh, that's not all from his estate where he makes a tremendous, not a tremendous amount of wine, makes a good deal of wine, but because he hires growers from other regions and buys grapes from Mendocino and so forth and so on. Um, uh, so um, now it's uh, astonishing the, that he's become, I mean, he's right up there with the biggest, like, uh, like, uh, Carlo, Ro not Carlo Rossi, uh, the, the um, brothers, uh, you know, the most famous name. Gallo. Huh? Gallo Burgers. <clears throat> Who? Gallo. The Gallo. Gallo brothers. Gallo brothers. Yeah. How could one forget the Gallos? Yeah. Uh, so uh, he's right up there with those. Yeah. And I, asked him, I said, do you? This is a. Uh, it's a fascinating story because uh, I have seen the Copeland shelf. Didn't realize he was such a big grower. Mm-hmm. Uh, producer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he is. He he also. Uh, has expanded into a number of very palatial palazzos uh, around the world. He probably has about four or five of them, <clears throat> a couple in Italy, one in the Caribbean, and they do very, very well. And uh, they're very wine-centered, of course. And I, I visited the one in, uh, in uh, Basilicata in, uh, in Italy, in the southern southern heel of Italy, and it's abs it's in the middle of nowhere, frankly. And at the moment, because of COVID, I'm sure nobody's going there. But uh, they did it upright, and that's where his daughter, Sophia, was uh, married. And wonderful Italian food, trattoria-style food, his own wines. And I asked him, I said, do you model your wines after the Italian wines that you fell in love with? And he says, 
I use many of the same grape varietals that the Italians do, but we have a very different terroir, very different soil uh, here than we have uh, over in Italy. Uh, so he says uh, California's a huge agricultural area, has many areas similar to different regions of the world, which is why you will find him and others making Barbera uh, and um, uh, using Sangiovese and some of the, the Italian wine uh, grapes, but he does not expect them to taste the way the best of the uh, ones made in Tuscany or Basilicata or anyplace else. So how would you uh, how would you rate there his wines in general? I would say you get great great bang for the buck at the lower end when you're talking about ten dollar wines for fifteen dollar wines. They're very he has a, he has a, a line called the director's cut, and um, no one's going to be disappointed with a wine like that for uh, for the money it costs. And then, as you say, he has Gia, which is a um, uh, his least expensive wine has a screw cap closure and um you know that's that's below ten dollars and it's it's drinkable it's 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 nothing wrong with it it's not a great wine um and then he has they said these uh very high-end wines which um uh are costing upwards of a hundred dollars and he puts his he really puts his uh um reputation on the line with those and they've gotten very good ratings from the various wine press so so now he's sort of retired. He says he, he's um, been inspired still by the older Italians. But I mean, look what happened to Fellini, who is much older than well, he's no longer with this. But he was inspired by the early Italian filmmakers. Um, but uh, he's he's pretty much retired now and happy holding his glass of wine with his grandchildren at his villa. Well, great. So uh, that's a fascinating look at uh, Francis Ford Coppola that I just uh, didn't know too much about. And I love I love his wines. All of a sudden, I'm a new fan of Coppola wines. Good. Okay. Well, this has been fascinating. Thank you again, John, for a uh, a wonderful journey in your world, sharing it with us. And Salute. we'll see you. We'll see you again soon. Sure will. Just dial in for Mariani. For more on celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage. Follow us on Facebook. Subscribe to us on YouTube. And tell your friends, Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life.